You've probably heard about the sharing economy, such as when someone told you about their great Airbnb vacation rental, or a friend summons a ride by tapping a smartphone app. But what is it really about? And what makes it different from the regular economy? Tom Slee is the author of What's Yours is Mine, Against the Sharing Economy. And he has some thoughts on this, and he joins us now for 10 questions on the sharing economy. Hi, Tom. Hello, Steve. You good to go? Yes. Question certainly. one. Why do you feel that the sharing economy would be better named the on-demand economy? Well, I mean, as you say, the model for this is companies coming in, setting up an internet platform that manages exchanges between people, right? Um, Short-term rentals, vacation rentals, or taxi rides are an obvious example, right? So early on, that got called the sharing economy, and we still call it that, because why not? But um, that focuses on the exchange between individuals, you know, and it says we can do this without the presence of, of a big company behind. You can just deal person to person. But what's happened increasingly is now we do have some big companies. We have some very big companies in this space. So that name is really, it's, it's really becoming something that, that doesn't really apply. A little misleading. Yeah, so increasingly the focus on demand, the on-demand economy focuses on the fact that you do this through your phone, you do this through a web browser, click, it's, it's a, the convenience, the focus on convenience. Another name is the gig economy, which focuses on the workers' side of this, hmm. and a, tem a tendency for it to be part-time and occasional work. Question two, why have you compared sharing economy jobs today to women's jobs of 40 years ago? Well, because if you look back at the 70s and the 60s, uh, when women were coming into the workforce in big numbers, we hear a lot of the same language. At that point, people said, you know, they don't need, it's not, in a sense, a real job. They don't need the same benefits as men because they're not the breadwinner for the household. This is not, a, you know, it, it's just a bit of extra money. And so we don't need these awkward things like benefits and equal pay for equal work and, and that kind of structure. Those arguments got lost you know, the, and, and we realize that, no, you do need a job is a job, and it needs the protections and standards that go along with it. Now, these companies are saying the same thing. Oh, it's not really a job. You know, it's just a bit of part-time work. So it's casual. We don't need this structure of benefits and sick leave and so on. Well, you know, I think we're seeing the same argument again, and I think we need to push back just as much as we did then. Question three, given that 71% of people working in the share econ sharing economy describe their experience as positive, mm -hmm. does it make sense to impose a host of rules and regulations on their work? Well, I think, uh, so it, it's, it's obviously a growing uh, phenomenon. Um, it's led by companies who are c currently privately owned. Um, they're pushing for growth at all costs. They're trying, they have a lot of money to keep people happy. And that's the model that they're going at. If they can't keep people happy now, they will never be able to keep happy once they actually have to report to investors about their bottom line. Um, so 70%, I mean, I would say that if you can't, if you've got 30% of you know, dissatisfied people at this stage, then, then that's a problem. What we do know is that it's an economy with a lot of flux in it. Uber drivers tend to come and go within a year, 50% turnover. <laughs> Airbnb hosts, you know, about 50% will come and go within a year. So there's a tendency to think, to think maybe, you know, it's all right until it isn't. Um, you know, this, the, the expenses of maintaining your car, perhaps, all of a sudden you realize, yeah, this was all right for a while, but now I've got to take it in for an extra checkup uh, because of the extra wear and tear on the car. Maybe it doesn't look so good. Question four. You write that the sharing economy separates risk from reward. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that uh, the whole premise of some of the big companies here is when push comes to shove, they say, we are just matchmakers between a service provider and a customer, right? So there's a company called Handy, for example, that does home cleaning and other odd jobs around the house. But if something goes wrong on that odd job, you can't really go to Handy to complain about it. You go to the person, the individual, and they say, and it's the same with all of them. If you look at the uh, agreements, and for all their talk of informality, their legal agreements are very thoroughly written, let me tell you. Um, you, know, you look and they say, when push comes to shove, this is not our problem. So they're, they're making money by pushing off the costs of standing behind their business. Question five, is the sharing economy as ecologically sustainable as it claims? Let me tell you how you do this, if you're Airbnb. So there are three types of people, right? There are people who don't travel. There's people who travel using Airbnb. And let's say there's people who travel using hotels. 
So when you want to talk about your economic contribution to a city, you compare your Airbnb travelers to the people who don't travel at all. And you say, look how much money we've brought to your city. Mm. When you want to talk about the, econo the ecological and environmental benefit, you compare the people who are traveling using Airbnb to people who are staying in hotels. And you say, look how green we are compared to the others. Mm. Well, you could do the comparison the other way around as well. You know, I think there's a lot of greenwashing going on mm. in, in those statements. And they're not examining their own business as carefully as they should. Question six, how big an impact does the sharing economy have on Canadian taxes? So right now, I mean, we've talked about maybe in the low tens of millions of, do uh, of dollars in terms of uh, transactions that maybe should be taxed that are not being taxed. Foregone revenue. In Foregone other words. revenue. Uh, but I think what's new about this is, as I was saying, we, we, we had this problem back with Amazon. A lot of the bookshops said it's unfair because if, if, if people come to us and buy a book, they have to pay HST. If they buy from Amazon, it's kind of a not-in-province not in transaction. Now we're seeing that, and so they don't have to pay HST. Now we're seeing that same model extend into the services. So a transaction obviously happens right here and now, you know, getting a ride from one place to another, all of a sudden is somehow not subject, um, or, or certainly Uber's part of it, not subject to Canadian tax. Um, so in the end, that makes them parasitic, if you like, on the cities in which they operate. Question seven, what can workers do to optimize the sharing economy? Well, I think uh, they've got a challenge because a lot of this is built around a model where they are, the phrase is, micro-entrepreneurs. Um, but in the end, they have a challenge. So it, it varies from industry to industry, but if you, if you are a driver working for Uber, you don't, for example, set the rates. So you're not an entrepreneur in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, one of the nice things that customers like about Uber is they don't have to deal with anyone. You press the button, you get the ride. But if you're a driver, then you get the other side of that. How do you negotiate with a piece of software? Um, how do you, how do you if, if you think you've been badly treated, who do you go to? It's not clear that there's anyone to go to. In the end, the best answer, I think, is that people need to get together, as they always have. Um, uh, and that's what unions were about a long time ago and still are to some extent. Um, there are a lot of forums uh, in which I would say particularly Uber drivers have started to gather together and argue for their interests. So I think, I think there are avenues where people can get together, can argue for their interests, and they need to do that collectively, as they always have done. And a bit of a follow-up, question eight, what can citizens do to make the sharing economy better? I think the main thing that we can do as citizens is to recognize that we, you know, in our lives we play three different roles. Say we are consumers, we are most of us workers of one kind or another, and we are citizens. And what we need to do is recognize that we cannot just let our consumer selves decide how our city should operate, right? I think for all its flaws, city governments are democratic institutions and democracy is important. And I don't think we should let the temptations of a free market, consumer-focused model undermine our ability to shape our own cities through democratic institutions. Question nine. We seem to be taking a municipality by municipality approach right mm -hmm. now to dealing with the sharing economy. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Um, it does, actually. Mm -hmm. I think it does. And I think if you look back, you have to ask why in the first place is, in the first place has tax, it's always been regulated city by city, not just in Canada, but around the world. And part of, you know, there are some regulations that are, are broader, labor standards regulations, safety regulations. But when it comes to the details, different cities have different needs. So in Toronto, the taxi industry um, is, there's a large part of it that is a, a hailing, a flag down kind of business. In Kitchener-Waterloo, where I live, they say that's about 5 to 10 percent of the business. So different cities are different. Some have a tourist problem where Airbnb makes a problem. Um, you know, other cities have no tourists. And so it's different needs for different places. Question 10. Why should people who use Uber or Airbnb care about any of the issues you've raised if all they want at the end of the day is cheaper rates and more convenience? Well, I think the question answers itself. If really all you want is cheaper rates and more convenience as a consumer, you know, you're free to argue for that. But does that end us, take us to a good place? No, I don't think it does. I think it leads to a race to the bottom in terms of salaries. Uh, and pay on the other side, and I think it leads to an erosion of our cities in terms of, um, you know, common infrastructure 
that is supported through, through businesses that do legitimate work here. That's 10 Questions with Tom Slee, author of What's Yours is Mine, Against the Sharing Economy. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.